don't know about you guys, but I needed that level of the presence of God this morning. It has been a roller coaster week for me. I started out the week by hearing a guy who's basically the unofficial czar of anti-bullying in America get up and begin to tear the Word of God apart in a high school and then begin to bully the Christians. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's kind of an oxymoron when the anti-bully guy begins to bully believers and call them pansies and begin to tear apart the Word of God. And he began to say that we have learned to ignore the BS of what the Word of God has to say about shellfish, and then he started at shellfish, and he ended up with our sexuality. And uh, about the time, and I think what, one of the things that hit me so hard is his last name is Savage, so there's probably one way or another that I'm related to him, and so I want to go talk to my cousin, whoop him up down one side and down the other. That, that's Ozark and for we're going to have talk. Um, at the same time, uh, there was an airing of Dr. Phil this week, and this, uh, this uh, lady has two severely retarded children. And you can't imagine what someone like that goes through. I mean, we, we, we understand that. But at the same time, she was pleading for the right to suicide them in the behalf of them. And basically to, you know, put them down. And I think what disturbed me was that when one woman said, you know, I just pray for God to give me strength to help my kids and that kind of thing, there was silence uh, in that auditorium. But the moment she began pleading for her right basically to have her children killed, uh, there was, there was you, could, you could hear the entire people backing her up. And when Dr. Phil said, how many identify the woman who like to have her children put to sleep? And 90% of, of those in the audience uh, it, it was devastating. We, we don't realize that, guys, we're one step away from Nazi Germany in America. Do, do you realize that Nazi Germany was a socialist government? It was called the Socialist Party. And uh, America has lost its way. We, we, have, we have lost the moral compass somewhere or another. I'm hearing now, there used to be that ethicists uh, labored to, to maintain the conscience of... Uh, of a, of a nation or of the planet, whether it's uh, a medical ethicist to make sure everything was done ethically. And what I'm seeing anymore, ethicists spend their time giving us excuses to embrace our sins, to embrace the dark side that's within us. And the final thing that was really, uh, I got in the flesh over this, guys. Uh, there is a movement that's beginning to take a hold, and it's called Toking the Holy Spirit, Toking the Holy Ghost. And suppose that people are breathing in the Holy Spirit and they're, it's like they're passing joints and they're getting high. Um, at a time that America's going to hell in a handbasket, we have this stupidity going on in the body of Christ. And let me tell you something, it is stuck on stupid. I don't know how, any other way of saying it. it now that, that's Ozarkian. But how many know sometimes Ozarkian phraseology really uh, bears to light? With, it, it is stuck on stupid. That we, we have darkness taking over every area, and we have this silliness going on in the church. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit really shows up in congregations, you don't start laughing. You start weeping and crying and getting right with God. That's right. Much less getting high. Oh. Burns me. How far we have come. I remember back in the 80s, I read a book by David Wilkerson on the vision. And in it, God prophetically showed him how it was going to be in the last days. And, and I thought back then, man, it's going to take us 100 years to get there. We're there. That's right. The only thing that we haven't seen that he prophetically spoke about was people disrobing and dancing naked together in churches and calling it worship. Just hang on, the emergent church will probably come out with it in a week or so. Guys, in our, in our last session, we discussed the need for the presence of God driven in our lives. That it's not being purpose driven, it's presence of God driven. That when I determine that I'm going to walk with God, that I desire his presence more than anything, I start getting all the junk out of my life. I start laying down every weight that so easily besets me. Oh, 
You see, what, what I have determined, what Mary and I are living proof of, guys, now we're not completely there yet. We're working at it, though. I mean, it, it, it's something we take seriously, okay? Is that where God dwells, where God rules, where God, where God commands, there is a place of blessing and safety. That's the key. It's where God dwells, God rules, and where God commands. That's what we find in Genesis. God rules, God commands, his presence was there. I'm trying to read from my notes because God spoke some very specific things to me. And in fact, I see this becoming, of course, I'm getting the unction of like, remember when I started Kingdom Authority 1, and I'm going Kingdom Authority 1, 2, and 3? I'm going to be at this for a while. We're going to use it for the school. And so I'm going to actually try to have the notes proofread and ready so that when I give you guys the DVD next week, you're actually going to have notes that you can put in a binder. But it, if we will move everything in earth to dwell in the presence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will move everything in heaven and earth to protect and to provide for us. If we'll rearrange our lives, throw out anything that is not kosher, That's right. throw out anything unholy, to walk with him that his presence becomes the most paramount thing in our lives. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That gets God's attention. That's right. God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. Right. And faith demands that. Right. Faith demands that I come in line with this Bible, yeah. that I come in line because I've got to have his presence. Now, if we do a theme for this series, I want to go back real quick to Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 12. Because right now, all the old, all the old places have been made waste places. There's no foundations. There's no, there's no path to walk in. That's a righteous path. Not really. And Isaiah 58, again, is the fasting chapter. It's where, where God was saying, listen, you need to start bringing down the evil. You need to start getting things out. Go back to my word. Go back to my commandments. To begin seeking me. And those that do that, it says, and they shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shall raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shall be called the repair of the breach and the restore of paths to dwell in. Now, I, I elaborated quite a bit on that last week, but the, the foundation part, we, we really, really need to understand. Let's, I want you to, to, to kind of hold that thought, but I want to go to Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. Because I want to show you the strategy of the devil. How many know that Satan is not his name, it's his title? It is a title that he took, Hasatan, which means the adversary. That he takes an adversarial role for all mankind. And one of his strategies we find here in, in Psalms chapter 11 and verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? He tears up the foundations and says, checkmate. And he has tore up the foundations. He has worked overtime in taking apart the very foundations of our faith. And guys, anything goes is not the kingdom way, and the devil knows it. And yet the church has used the cross and God's grace to anything goes. That's not kingdom. Guys, it is a time to restore the foundations. We have got to rebuild our hedges of protection and to establish the true and biblical paths for us to walk it and to dwell in. If we don't, what can we do? It is really time to get serious about our walk with God because let me tell you something. Everybody is going off a cliff quickly. I, I have never seen such an acceleration, not only in the secular world, but in the church to get off. You know, and, and when, when I begin to, when God begins to put things together for me, I begin to, I, I see things visually. I, I can take concepts of whether it's physics or the word, and it's like a puzzle that I can, I can literally see items of it. Some of us are very word-oriented. Some of us are very visually oriented. I'm visual. I've got to see how things fit together. And so the last month or so, God's been showing me the same concept in different ways. He's been showing me... Uh, foundations are made of stone and those stones are being removed and where buildings collapse. He's been showing me stones of remembrance. One of the things the Illuminati has done is they have removed stones of remembrance out of, out of, out of societal's memory. 
Because there, there's power in remembering. The reason that we take communion is to remember. The reason we do the feast is to remember. Because in remembering, you lose the power of that thing in your life. And if we, we take away those stones of remembrance, we're, we're in deep trouble. And that's, that's one of the reasons we, it, those stones of remembrance become anchors to us. And right now, the society and most of the church has no anchor. We stand in church and sing the anchor holes <laughs> while we're being tossed to and fro by everyone to doctrine. And finally, he began to show me uh, cobblestone paths. That there, are, there are stones that we need to, uh, there, there are stepping stones that we need to have in our walk with God that make up the path that we're supposed to walk in. And right now, it, it, it's almost like we're, there, there's an old kid's game called Break the Ice. You know where the guy's standing, you break all the ice? Well, this is somehow or another, the, the, the pieces are suspended in midair, but you almost have to be a leaper to get to the next one. They're so far because so many of those stones have been removed. And you don't, and one of the things we, we need to understand is, it, it's like you can't understand man until you understand God. And when you understand God and you understand man, you can understand sin. And when you can finally understand God, man, and sin, you understand repentance. You understand the need for the cross. You, but you, you, th th they have to go in order. There's, there's a certain way that they have to go. Otherwise, it really doesn't make sense. And then for that guy, then truth becomes like springs. No, I'm looking for bedrock. I'm looking for, I'm looking for a rock that is stable in any situation. I believe the stones that God keeps taking me back to represent the truths that have been taken away from the body of Messiah. And guys, they're being replaced with half-truths, pagan concepts, pop psychology, and supernatural manifestations of demonic spirits that are being accepted as the Spirit of God because they have no foundation to help them decide That's which right. one is which. Yeah. So it's time to get back to the book. Yeah. For the most part, we are a people that don't know who God is. We don't know his word. And guys, it's time for that to change. Now, I want to deal with Revelation first. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to blend the concept of halicha, of walking with God, with the dynamic of being spirit-filled and systematic theology. We're going to kind of bring it all together. So put on your seatbelts, all right, because we, we, we got a lot of things to do. And I'm, there's some things that I'm going to read. And God reveals himself to men in, in several ways. Now, we, we, need to, we need to know that God needs to reveal himself. The finite cannot understand the infinite. No more than if I'm plodding along out in my yard. You know, those real itty-bitty ants are about like this. I forgot. There's the big carpenter, I mean, the real itty bitty ones. Okay? My size 15 shoe goes over one of those. How does that ant define who just walked by? How does that, all it can see is it darkened the sun. <laughs> you know, it, it blackened out the sky and the, and the ground shook. Now it's just from my foot. <laughs> when you have size 15, it kind of does that. Does a, I'm sorry, ants, you know. But how does he comprehend just a mere human walking by? How much more would it be difficult for us to understand God unless he reveals himself? He is the soul. He, he, Solomon had it right when they dedicated the temple and he said the universe is not big enough to contain God. There are two ways that he does it. The first one is called general revelation. And this is the nature of general revelation. General revelation refers to the way God reveals himself generally to all men. These are things by which it is possible for anyone anywhere in the world to know about God because God has revealed himself in a general way to all. The nature of general revelation is that this revelation is embodied in things. General revelation has been defined as the embodiment of divine thought in the phenomenon of nature, in fact, or in experience of history in the general constitution of the human mind. 
This means that God reveals himself in certain ways to all men, and this is why it is called general revelation. It appears to all men. It is a revelation available to all men. The main object of general revelation is to supply man's need for spiritual answers and to persuade the souls of men to seek after God. Again, general revelation is the revelation by which God reveals himself to all men. It emphasizes its, or its emphasis is to get man to begin searching for God in a real and a personal way. And that is taking, taken from the Messianic Study Bible Collection uh, from Aerial Ministries. I thought he did a real good job with that. But we look at the world around us. Everything, even where the planet is situated, not only in our solar system, but in, in the spiral galaxy that we are in, everything is set up for discovery. That, that, that's one thing that astrophysicists have a hard time explaining is why, why are we placed where we're placed? And why it's like God said, okay, kids, I'm going to make it real easy on you. I'm going to put you here. I'm going to put this here and put this here so that you can look up and say, whoa, somebody of extreme intelligence had to put this thing together. To think that mankind... That I, at one time man was, was, was somehow a, a, a primordial ooze that came up and, and that, well, that single cell organism was able to develop the amino acids and everything else that it needed to evolve into a human being. It takes more faith to believe in that than to believe in God. In fact, I like intellectually honest physicists and scientists because the more that they realize some things, the, the, the more they understand that there's a God. I'm reminded of the, uh, it was a Russian man that uh, he was an expert in quantum algebra. That's, that's a very specific, it's the hardest form of mathematics on the planet. And there's only probably a handful of people that can even comprehend this. And, and he decided he wanted to find out when the universe was perfect. And so he began to do as a physicist would do using quantum algebra. And he figured, because the, the teaching is we're evolving into something, moving toward perfection. And so he spent several years working the math, and the guy got saved. You know why? He found out that the universe was perfect about 6,000 years ago and has been moving away from perfection ever since. And so he took his mathematical, all his formula and, and the pages upon pages upon pages, and he let the top experts in quantum algebra review it. They say, your math is perfect, we just don't like the conclusion. And you see, that's what happens in a lot of science. Scientists, they come with the pre-notion, there is no God, all it's evolution, and therefore they look at God's splendor and they choose to see something else. But God, with, with, with all the magnificence that, that is the universe... God said, this is the general revelation, is that I exist, that this was not by accident, that there was a God, and it causes you to begin to ask more questions. It causes you to begin to seek. That's the purpose of general revelation. Now, the nature of special revelation, that's where God says, now that you're looking, I'm going to go ahead and give you something really substantial. The second major mode of revelation is special revelation. The nature of special revelation is that it is embodied in words. General revelation is embodied in things. Special revelation is embodied in words. Whereas general revelation is revelation embodied in things, special revelation is embodied in words. In special revelation, God makes himself known at specific times through specific people and in specific ways. Guys, we need to understand that God's word is a vital part of special revelation that God gives. In fact, the word of God is the benchmark to determine whether something is special revelation from God or if it's a deception from the enemy. This word. This word, what you hold in your laps, is the most miraculous thing in existence. It is the only book that can not only change a heart, but just the number of prophetic utterances, sometimes uh, given thousands of years apart, that to, to come down to such accuracy is an impossibility. And I could go on and on just about all the magnificent things that are in this book. The more you, the more you understand quantum physics, did you know the Bible said the earth was round before man did? In the Old Testament. 
said it was round. Well, man's go around. Why did mankind think it was flat? They didn't believe the word. I mean, the, all of it's there, but this, this is the benchmark right here. This word that God supernaturally breathed through men, and he has supernaturally preserved it, guys. This is the most loved book and the most hated book on the planet. And, the only, and you know, it used to be there was nobody ambivalent about the word. I've got to change that. There's a good portion of the church that is ambivalent about the word. But as far as those that really know God love it, and those that are in darkness hate this book with a passion, whether they are a liberal, a socialist, whatever they are, or an atheist, they hate this book because they cannot explain it. They have to dismiss it. But they do so in general broad terms. So the, 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 the things that include special revelation, guys, the Word of God, theophanies, that's the appearances of God in the Old Testament where he showed up, miracles, divine communication, angels, and finally the incarnation where God in his Word dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. I like what Isaac Rotenberg said. I was at a yeshiva with him and... Uh, great thinker and understands his, his mother was Jewish and his father was German, I believe, and he kind of survived the, the whole thing in Germany. But one day we were at a discussion and he said, he goes, he says, you don't get it. He said, the God of the Bible is really kind of rude. He says, he shows up and says, if you're going to walk with me, you got to do it this way or I ain't walking with you. Now, it makes perfect sense if you understand who God is. If you don't understand who he is, then, oh, well, no, no, he would never do that. There's disgrace. Well, there's grace, yes. But it still doesn't change the fact of what sin will do if it comes in contact with that which is absolutely holy. Sin becomes absolutely a grease spot, and the cross does not change that. You've got to understand God. And so the first stone this morning that we're going to begin putting together is the stone of God. You've got to start with God. And it's probably going to take us several Sabbaths to go through this. And I'm simply going to go by, you see, God, God reveals himself in several ways. He reveals himself by his names. How I many know oh, God has a lot of names in the Bible? Each one kind of shows us a glimpse of that portion of him because we're, we're still like the ant looking at the size 15 shoe go by you can only see little parts and comprehend little parts at a time but as as you do your comprehension begins to grow and if we spend our whole life doing this we're still going to be astounded when we get to heaven because there are angels that ever since they were created behold his face and all they say is holy 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 day and night that in that moment between them saying the last holy and the next holy, they see something so wonderful, so spectacular that they have never seen about God before that they cause them to cry out holy all over again. And they will do that for all eternity. Our problem is our minds aren't big enough to stretch around the God that we serve. And to do this, now, I thought this was, was so poetic, the way that God took me. Let's go to Genesis 1.1. Because God, I'm going to show you this morning, God will tell you the end from the beginning. The biggest war right now that we're fighting in the earth, that why people hate this word so much, people hate the, the, the gospel so much and are trying to change it. The reason they hate all this is found in Genesis 1. In fact, the whole book of Revelation is about Genesis 1 when you understand Genesis 1. Are you ready? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In Hebrew, it's Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. He revealed himself as Elohim. In the beginning, 
Elohim created. Elohim is the name of God, the all-powerful creator. He started it with I am the creator. He did not argue his existence. He told us why we existed. Wouldn't, now, if you were starting a book to reveal yourself to man, wouldn't you think that you would have to debate your, your existence? God is saying, no, no, no. Of course, you know, there, there, there are uh, <laughs> philosophers that are trying to figure out if they are. Do I really exist? So you, with those guys, it's impossible to get them to understand that God exists if they haven't figured out they exist. The government thinks I exist, especially around April 15th, every year. Come on. My stomach thinks I exist two, three, four, five, six times a day, depending upon what's going on that day. But God doesn't argue that he exists. He begins to show us why we exist. Because he's the creator. Now in this phrase, Bereshit bra Elohim et, that et is Aleph Tav in the Hebrew. When Jesus showed up on the Isle of Patmos and talked with John, he did not say, I am the Alpha and Omega. Now, it is properly interpreted Alpha and Omega because it was written in Greek, but these were two Jewish boys talking, okay? A Jewish God, Jewish boy. He said, I'm the Aleph Tav. And John went, what? <laughs> because the Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning, in Bereshit, there was a word that the rabbis had been debating for centuries. Who was the Isle of Tav? What is that word that dwells in the heavens right next to Elohim? Yeshua. The whole purpose of the book of Gospel of John was to tell us who the Olive of Tav was. That he was a part of the creation process. So much so that God did not even say El, which is the singular form of God. Here, Elohim is plural. But how many know that we do not serve a pantheon? So you can take Samarimus and Tammuz and Nimrod and roll them up and throw them away. Okay? And I even think our understanding of the Trinity is a little flawed because I think it was influenced by the Catholic Church. I believe that God showed up as three witnesses of himself. Now let's say three persons. But three witnesses. Because God, by his own standard, says everything has to be established in two or three witnesses. Now, if you just have two and they try to discredit one, what happens? It blows the witness apart, doesn't it? So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We even see this in, in Hero Israel, the Lord of God is one. It's basically Hero Israel, God, 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 is Echad, is one. Because Elohenu is the singular form of Elohim. There's another singular form. And so we look and we say, God came as three witnesses. If you dismiss the Son, you have not blown God's witness. You can reject Jesus and you still do not nullify the witness of God in the earth. Because God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Father, will still convict you and still hold you accountable. God's awesome. He played, well, God, when he began to put this thing together, he did so by stacking the deck in our favor. And our favor means it's in his favor. Let's look at some things about God revealing himself as Elohim. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Unto me who am less than the least of all the saints, 
is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, the Aleph Tav, who created all things. That created all things is paramount to the discussion. It is paramount to what's going on in the earth. Let's look at another one. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created which are in heaven which are, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Why are you sticking the New Testament? Because I'm trying to deal with believers. I'm trying to get them to connect the dots together, okay? Glory to God. In the beginning, God created. This is, this is verification in the New Testament. And finally, in Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, I think it's interesting that we find that going on in the book of Revelation, and yet it's told from the very beginning. <laughs> Now, let me, let me explain to you why this is so important. There is a war raging in all areas of society today. We especially find this battle being played out in the educational systems of the Western world. Man is rejecting the general revelation from God. Thus, man is rejecting the concept of a creator. This is paramount. This is paramount. Guys, this, is the, this, this concept, if I can dismiss God as the creator, it is the linchpin to the working of darkness in this time in history. That's why evolution is another gospel. It is another gospel. And it actually takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in intelligent design takes more faith. If, you know, this is why, guys, here, now hear me. If God is creator, he will have revealed himself to man. He will have established what he expects from his creation, i.e., his standard of conduct. His creation is answerable to him for both their conduct and what they have accomplished with their lives. That we are responsible to reflect the true nature of our Creator in our lives. That right now is the battle. If there's a Creator, I am answerable to that Creator. The Creator sets the standards. I've got to follow them. How many know there's a, there's a Creator of the truck that I drive out there that was drafted on the boards of Nissan. And they designed that truck. They put the parts in that truck. Now that truck can decide that it wants to be more green and run on water, but how many know that won't work? It can, design, it can decide it would like to be a station wagon rather than a truck. Maybe it would like to be a, a Ferrari sports car. A four-wheel drive one. Mike is going, yeah. It can't be that because its creator designed it to be something else. Come on. Come on. That's right. It was created to be rugged. Now it may try to paint itself pink. <laughs> it may do a lot of things to make itself, you know, less rugged looking. But that thing was made to work. It can't make itself into anything else because the creator had something designed for it. 
and in that design, you've got to put gasoline in one end. You've got to make sure you get the oil in the other. It's got plenty of other places that you've got to maintain it the way that the creator of that thing did it. Otherwise, it will begin falling apart. Uh-oh. And so what's interesting is if you pull out a manual on your vehicle, it will not only tell you what to put in it, it will tell you what not to put in it. Because if you start putting in it what you're not supposed to put in it, it will start breaking down. It'll start falling apart. And yet Christians ignore what the Creator said we're to put in us and not to put in us. And then we try to constantly run to Him for healing while we put the very things in us His instruction book told us not to. And I'm not just talking about pork. How many know hatred doesn't belong in the human psyche? Unforgiveness doesn't belong in the human psyche. All these different things that, because if you walk in, if you walk in unforgiveness, and this is, this is clinically, scientifically proven, that your brain, I mean, it's, it's a magnificent machine. No computer can ever come near your brain. The supercomputers cannot come near the complexity of what your brain does. But your brain also secretes almost 1,000 different chemicals. It's like a gland. And if you walk in joy, if you walk in forgiveness, if you walk in love, your brain begins to secrete chemicals throughout your body that lubricate your joints in your body and begin to optimize the health of your body. If you begin walking in hatred and anger and unforgiveness, it will begin secreting chemicals that will absolutely dry up the lubricants in all your joints. It will, it will, it will, it will reduce your immune system almost down to zero. When God said, the joy of the Lord is my strength, he wasn't kidding. If I walk in that joy, I become almost bulletproof to the, to the environment around me. That all the, the germs have a hard time taking hold because my immune system is supercharged. And then if I don't put in the toxins that God tells me not to put in my body, then my, my immune system is not reduced or so busy fighting this other stuff, it doesn't have time to fight the cancer cells. It's like pouring sugar and water in your vehicle. How many know that you may not make it around the block? Because there was a creator. And when you use it for the purposes that it was created for, it lasts. When we begin finding out, when I begin recognizing I have a creator, he has a standard of conduct, and that standard of conduct is a balance between dealing with his holiness and dealing with what's best for me in the long run. God's commandments are never short-sighted. God always looks at that, not only the long run here on the earth, but how many know the life hereafter? It's all included in it. Because when God, God wants you, when you get to heaven, he doesn't want you to show up empty-handed. That's one of the things that the feasts of the Lord teach us is never appear before the Lord empty-handed. And you cannot take your checkbook with you when you go to heaven. You can only take the things that you did and did not do. That's all you can take. I've heard, I've heard Christians over the years going, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to have them crowns. Well, yeah, you maybe. <laughs> but if you do... It, you'll, you'll have them on it just long enough to take them off right. and to cast them at his feet. Isn't that what we just read? Yeah. The most embarrassing place in the universe will be right. when it's time to cast your crowns and there's nothing upon your head. Yeah. That God, you didn't get anything done in my life except getting me here. The Apostle Paul called that being saved by fire. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians. But guys, if there's no creator, then we define our own standards of conduct. We establish what our lives will and will not be. We determine what our lives will reflect, and we're answerable to no one or nothing. It reduces you. I'm either created in the image of God, and therefore that gives me dignity, or if I believe in evolution, I'm an animal. I am an evolved animal. 
I am an animal who has become self-aware. But I still have all these animalistic instincts. God's word commands you, you rein in your instincts. <laughs> you rein in your need to procreate. You rein in your sexuality and you do it according to God's standards because he's the one that made you. No more than my truck out there can become a Ferrari sports car. I mean, know that if you, I mean, that thing's got a powerful engine. It will it'll almost break your neck sometimes if you step on the gas too quickly. I mean, it, it's a big bad boy. But if I take it on a racetrack, I will flip it over because it's not made to hug the curves. It's impossible for it to do it. As much as he loves to go fast, he cannot. He goes fast straight. He will not go fast around curves because a four-wheel drive will flip itself. And there's no way around it because that's the way it was designed. And then people get mad at God when they flip their lives and they're unhappy and, and things aren't working right. And so they think, well, the, the problem is, is that society doesn't accept me. No, the problem is you flipped your life. You wrecked your life. And you've let the devil wreck your life. Well, brother, I've got feelings. I have a lot of feelings too. There's times I had feelings I want to take people's heads off, but I went ahead and pulled brain back those feelings. It's called maintaining this vessel in sanctification. I've also found that when people, when they allow demonic presence in their lives, that demon will make you think that those feelings are yours. There are people with inferiority demons that no matter how much they achieve, they feel like they're not worth a thing. They get delivered, and the little things in life bring them joy again. It can be that way sexually. It can be that way financially. There's a lot of different areas. Don't confuse your bondages. Don't confuse the junk in your trunk with what the Creator made you to be. If somebody came back and left a dying carcass in the back of my pickup truck, how many know that is not the Creator's fault? It is not Nissan's fault. Somebody did that. And that makes that thing a stinking bad thing to be around. But you do not say, well, that was its destiny. It was just made to stink. It was just made to, to cause people to be rejected by, it, by its odor and its smell, and, and nobody loves that truck anymore. It was just the destiny of that truck. No, it's because some demonic force lose something in it that if you go back to the Creator, the Creator will tell you how to clean it out and to restore it back to His design. Am I making sense this morning? You see, everything that's going on right now in society, the liberal hates this book. They hate it, especially with the people that actually read it, because they, they try to, the, the, the most odd-looking thing in the universe is a liberal trying to quote from the Bible. <laughs> My favorite word is the word. Okay? It is the most awkward, it is the most aggravating thing. And any time they ever really try to quote from it, they bring condemnation on themselves and don't have the intelligence that that is what they've done. It's like after 9-11, so they, they turn to the word and says, we will rebuild, we will be stronger. You're cursing yourself, dummy. God's trying to give you a clue, and so what do you do? You do the same mistake the dude in the Bible did, and that's why they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were known for the ones who created terrorism. And so as the northern tribes started their war on terror, so we have started ours. But in neither case did they ever return to God. Oh. Then we have the scientist that believes in evolution. Evolution has now become his religion. They say there is no God, but most of the time, that, what, what I have seen, guys, is either they're trying to become gods themselves. Whether it's through the Grimm projects, where they're using nanotechnology, uh, genetics, and all these different things to develop the next Superman, human 2.0. They're trying to create gods or demigods like Hercules and Apollos and all this. They're going back, and we've already went through all that, guys, once. It was called Genesis chapter 6. They're trying to do it again today, but for a lot, that's not enough. 
that we have some of the best minds on the planet that have rejected God, that have rejected the creator, but they're not satisfied, they're driven to create their own. It's called the singularity. I'm not talking about a singularity in space-time, I'm talking about an intelligence singularity. They say that they're on the verge of creating a super artificial intelligence that they're ready to worship. Because within one day it will be able to assimilate all knowledge of mankind and then take it the next step further to where it can begin saying, here's how you cure cancer, here's how, you, here's how everybody goes green and everybody goes happy and everybody can still drive big cars. And the, and the proponents behind this, and it's not just an American thing, it's all, this, it's all the, the, the first world nations are working, they're in a race not only to develop the super soldier or the next Nephilim, they are, they are all working together in concert because they believe that if they can create this thing, it will give them all the answers. Because they have rejected all these answers, they are trying to create something that will give them all the answers that they want to hear. Governments putting billions of dollars into it. And then we read in the book of Revelation that there is an image that the false prophet is able to make alive who will cause all men, great or small, to take the mark. Why? Because what is the first thing a computer want to do? It wants to put a barcode on everything so it can identify everything. Everything has to have a, a subcategory. It has to have a place in its program for it to be able to, to quantify and then control. And the people behind some of this, if, if you read their own literature, they say that when this happens, when the, when the singularity comes and human 2.0 comes, that there is going to be a war between the old species and the new species. And the new species is, one, is going to want to eradicate them. If you don't take the mark, you're going to be eradicated. Because part of the mark may include genetic manipulation. Here's a shot, Chuck. Now, when I give it to you, it's going to rewrite your DNA your intelligence is going to explode. You're going to have the body of a 20-year-old man. You're going to live for at least 500 years and never have a pain, never be sick, a disease, never be tired again, to never even have a cold again, to be able to live your life like you want to. Then we find in the book of Revelation that some of these guys, after they get their injection, very possibly, where they have the super long life, God starts judging the earth and they want to die and can't. All because they said Elohim was not the creator. The whole book of Revelation is daddy comes home. The creator comes back and says it's time to take inventory. I gave you 6,000 years to discover me. I sent my son. He died for you to set you free. Now it's time to come back and take an account. Because I am, you see, in better sheet, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And because of that, all of creation is accountable to him. All creation. Now, when God literally said, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning, how many realized this morning it didn't take him past the first sentence to tell us the end from the beginning? How many see that this morning? The good news is that Almighty God came in the flesh and said, let me help you balance the books. I'll take your debt. I'll take your disobedience. I'll take your sin. And I'll nail it to the cross. When the Apostle Paul said the, the writing of ordinance that was against us, he nailed to the cross, he wasn't talking about this. How many know that if you have broken a bunch of laws and those attorneys bring out the book that has all the things, all the violations you did wrong, 
and you broke this law and that law and this law and that law, and sometimes it can go on. If you, if you understand legalese, it can go on for page after page after page after page. And so they have discovered that you owe $2 billion in fines and penalties. Impossible to give. Impossible for you to pay. And someone walks in and says, I'll pay it. And they pay it. And they mark paid in full. How many know that that did not do away with all the laws that you broke? It did away with the violations that were held against you in that court. That is what Paul was talking about, that the devil is like a prosecuting attorney. He wants you to say that there's no creator so that he can infiltrate your life. He can take those violations, and he's empowered by it. But what he hates is this big old long list, this docket that is against you of legal, uh, legal ramifications of your denial of the creator and his commandments. What he hates is when you surrender to Jesus, Jesus takes that out of his hands and nails it to the cross and writes paid in full. You can no longer hold that against them. The gospel falls apart if there's no creator. The reality of spiritual warfare falls apart if there's no creator. It all hinges. Everything hinges on Genesis 1.1. That's why evolution and eugenics were released into the earth. Actually, by the same family. You have Darwin, and, what, and it was actually his dad, I believe it was, that came up with actually the idea of evolution. It was his cousin that came up with eugenics. Kind of all runs in the family. And what gets me is we forget that eugenics did not have its birthplace in Nazi Germany. Eugenics had its birthplace in the United States of America, and we imported it to Germany. And Hitler simply took it to its logical conclusion based upon his warped, occultic philosophies. And eugenics is coming back in America. You see, if, there, see, if, if there's a creator and you're created in the image of God, you have dignity. You should have dignity from the day that you're born to the day that you die. You should have dignity. But now we have the health czar, that uh, his philosophy is cycle of life, that if you're young and, you're, and, you're, and you have cancer or something like that, you can't do anything to society, so you're not going to get treatment. This is the guy that's actually piecing together the national health care bill. Or if you're too old to where it's going to be too much money to take care of you and forget about what you've done to, for society before then, but now after treatment, if there's not enough, you just need to, to lay and just be placed over in a hospital someplace and, and you'll be denied treatment. It's the socialistic way. Because you're not going to, from that day forward, add anything else to society. You see, there's no dignity. It's not what you can add to the Creator's vision for your life. It's what you can add to the collective. For the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But what, what's amazing to me, it's never the many that do anything that's ever worthwhile. It's always the few. It's always the few that believe in a creator. It's always a few that realize that they have dignity because they were created in the image of God and they begin working and dedicating their lives through Jesus to restore the image. And out of that image comes great creativity. Great purpose, great power. Because that's the way God intended it from the very beginning. How many have a little bigger piece of the rock this morning for your stone of who God is? We're just getting started. We may end up having a 16-part series of just who God is because I'm thinking it's, <laughs> it's big. He's big. He is awesome. But the more you discover about him, the more you discover his grace. Because he loved us and gave himself for us while we were yet sinners. We rejected him and he said, okay, plan B, I want to get you back where I wanted you. I'm going to have a family. God is good. He's worthy, like we sang this morning, he is worthy of the highest praise. 
worthy of the best that we could ever give. He's worthy. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Father, we confess that you are the creator of heaven and earth. That this planet, this universe, and all that inhabits this universe are answerable to you. Father, the things visible and things invisible. Father, every angel, every demon will have to answer to you. Everything that was ever created will answer to you because you are the creator of all. And Father, right now we take that part of the rock of who you are and begin building the paths to walk in. It starts with you and it ends with you, Father. Oh, give us the grace to hear. Give us the, the grace to, to understand who you are and your ways, Father. And most of all, help us understand what the cross was really about and what it means to us in our lives. Father, let the cross may have its fullest impact in us as we go through this series we have.